The 15th law of success and the 16th and final part of our law of success series is the golden rule, which will teach you how to make use of this great universal law of human conduct in a manner that may easily get harmonious cooperation from any individual or group of individuals. With this lesson, we approach the apex of the pyramid of this course on the law of success. This lesson is the guiding star that will enable you to use profitably and constructively the knowledge assembled in the preceding lessons. There's more power wrapped up in the preceding lessons of this course than most men could trust themselves with. Therefore, this lesson is a governor that will, if observed and applied, enable you to steer your ship of knowledge over the rocks and reefs of failure that usually beset the pathway of all who su cut, come suddenly into possession of power. If you demand proof positive of the soundness of the laws upon which this course in general and this lesson in particular is founded, I must plead inability to offer it except through one's witness, and that is yourself. You may have positive proof only by testing and applying these laws for yourself. If you demand more substantial and authoritative evidence than my own, then I'm privileged to refer you to the teachings of and philosophy of Christ, Plato, Socrates, Epictetus, Confucius, Emerson, and two of the more modern philosophers, James and Munsterberg, from whose, from whose works I have appropriated all that constitutes the more important fundamentals of this lesson, with the exception of that which I have gathered from my own limited experience. The golden rule means substantially to do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you if your positions were reversed. But why? What is the real reason for this kindly consideration of others? The real reason is this. There is an eternal law through the operation of which we reap that which we sow. When you select the rule of conduct by which you guide yourself in your transactions with others, will you be fair and just? Very, un very likely, if you know that you are setting into motion by that selection a power that will run its course of for weal or woe in the lives of others, returning finally to help or to hinder you according to its nature. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall be he also reap. It is your privilege to deal unjustly with others, but if you understand the law upon which the golden rule is based, you must know that your unjust dealings will come home to roost. If you fully understood the principles described in Lesson 11 on accurate thought, it will be quite easy for you to understand the law upon which the golden rule is based. You cannot pervert or change the course of this law, but you can adapt yourself to its nature and thereby use it as an irresistible power that will carry you to heights of an achievement which will not be attained without its aid. This law does not stop by merely flinging back upon you your acts of injustice and unkindness toward others. It goes further than this, much further, and returns to you the results of every thought that you release. Therefore, not alone is it advisable to do unto others as you wish them to do unto you, but to avail yourself fully to the benefits of this universal and great law. You must think of others as you wish them to think of you. The law upon which the golden rule is based begins affecting you either for good or evil, the moment you release a thought. It has amounted almost to a worldwide tragedy that people have not generally understood this law. Despite the simplicity of the law, it is practically all there is to be learned that is of enduring value to men, for it is the medium through which we become the masters of our own destiny. Understand this law, and you understand all that the Bible has to unfold to you. For the Bible presents one unbroken chain of evidence in support of the fact that man is the maker of his own destiny and that his thoughts and acts are the tools with which he does the making. He goes on to talk about the power of prayer. He says that it may be an old-fashioned idea, but somehow I can't get away from the belief that no man can attain success in its highest form without the aid of earnest prayer. Prayer is the key with which one may open the secret doorway referred to in the Lesson 11. In this age of mundane affairs, when the uppermost thought of the majority of people 
is centered upon the accumulation of wealth or the struggle for mere existence, it is both easy and natural for us to overlook the power of earnest prayer. I'm not saying that you should resort to prayer as a means of solving your daily problems which press for immediate attention. No, I'm not going to f that far in a course of instruction which will be studied largely by those who are seeking in it the road to success that is measured in dollars. But may I not modestly suggest to you at least give prayer a trial after everything else fails to bring you a satisfying success. A passive attitude toward the golden rule will bring no results. It is not enough to merely to believe in the philosophy while at the same time failing to apply it in your relationships with others. If you want results, you must take a, an active attitude toward the golden rule. A mere passive attitude represented by beliefs in its soundness will avail you nothing nor will it avail you anything to proclaim to the world your belief in the golden rule while your actions are not in harmony with your proclamation. Conversely stated, it will avail you nothing to appear to, the, to, to practice the golden rule while at heart you are willing and, e and eager to use this universal law of right conduct as a cloak to cover up a covetous and selfish nature. Murder will out. Even the most ignorant person will sense you for what you are. Human character does not ever more publish itself. It will not be concealed. It hates darkness and it rushes into light. A man passes for what he's worth. What he, is, what he is engraves itself on his face, on his form, on his fortunes, in letters of light which all men would may read but himself. If you would not be known to do anything, never do it. A man may play the fool in the drifts of a desert, but every grain of sand shall seem to see. It, and that's an Emerson quote. It is a law upon which the golden rule philosophy is based, to which Emerson has reference in this foregoing quotation. It, it was this same law that he had in mind when he wrote the following. Every violation of truth is not only a sort of suicide and a liar, but is a stab at the health of human society. On the most profitable lie, the course of events presently lays a destructive tax, whilst frankness proves to be the best tactic. For it invites frankness, puts, puts the parties on a convenient footing and makes their business a friendship. Trust men and they will be true to you. Treat them greatly and they will show themselves great, though they make an exception in your favor to all the rules of trade. If you wish to know what happens, to a man when he totally disregards the law upon which the golden rule philosophy is based, pluck out any man in your community whom you know to live for the single dominating purpose of accumulating wealth and who has no conscientious scruples as to how he accumulates that wealth. Study this man and you will observe that there is no warmth in his soul. There is no kindness to his words. There is no welcome to his face. He has become a slave to the desire for wealth. He is too busy to enjoy life and too selfish to wish to help others enjoy it. He walks and talks and breathes, but he is nothing but a human automaton. Yet there are many who envy such a man and wish that they might occupy his position, foolishly believing him to be a success. There can never be a success without happiness, and no man can be happy without dispensing happiness to others. Moreover, the dispensation must be voluntary and with no other object in view than that of spreading sunshine into the hearts of those whose hearts are heavy laden with burdens. Perhaps you have wondered why the subject of honesty has not been mentioned in this course as a prerequisite to success, and if so, the answer will be found in this lesson. The golden rule philosophy, when rightly understood and applied, makes dishonesty impossible. It does more than this. It makes impossible all the other destructive qualities, such as selfishness, greed, envy, bigotry, hatred, and malice. When you apply the golden rule, you become, at one and the same time, both the judge and the judged, the accused and the accuser. This places one in a position in which honesty begins in one's own heart, toward oneself, and extends to all others with equal effect. Honesty based upon the golden rule is not the brand of honesty which recognizes nothing but the question of expediency. If all your acts toward others and even your thoughts of others are registered in your subconscious mind through the principle of autosuggestion, thereby building your own character an exact duplicate of your thoughts and acts, can you not see how important it is to guard those acts and thoughts? 
We are now in the very heart of the real reason for doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. For it is obvious that whatever we do unto others, we do not, we do unto, un, we do unto ourselves. Stated in another way, every act and every thought you release modifies your own character in exact conformity with the nature of the act or thought. And your character is a sort of center of magnetic attraction, which attracts to you the people and conditions that harmonize with it. You cannot indulge in an act toward another person without having first created the nature of that act in your own thought. And you cannot release a thought without planting the sum and substance of the, and nature of it in your own subconscious mind there to become a part and parcel of your own character. Grasp this simple principle and you will understand why you cannot afford to hate or envy another person. You'll also understand why you cannot afford to strike back in kind at those who do, do an injustice. Likewise, you will understand the injunction return good for evil. Understand the law upon which the golden rule injunction is based, and you will understand also the law that eternally binds all mankind in a single bond of fellowship and renders it impossible for, for you to injure another person by thought or deed without injuring yourself. And likewise, adds to your own character the results of every kind of thought and deed in which you indulge. Understand this law and you will then know beyond room for the slightest doubt that you are constantly punishing yourself for every wrong you commit and reward yourself for every act of constructive conduct in which you indulge. Remember that your reputation is made by others, but your character is made by you. You want your reputation to be a, fair, fair, a favorable one, but you cannot be sure that it will be for the reason that it is something that exists outside of your own control in the minds of others. It is what others believe you to be. With your character, it is different. Your character is that which you are as a result of your thoughts and deeds. You control it. You can make it weak, good or bad. When you're satisfied and know in your mind that your character is above reproach, you need not worry about your reputation for it is as, it is as impossible for your character to be destroyed and damaged by anyone except yourself as it, is in, as it is to destroy matter or energy. And then we have the conclusion of this law as well as the entire course on success. If you've mastered the fundamentals upon which the lesson is based, you understand why it is that no public speaker can move his audience or convince men of his argument unless he himself believes that which he is saying. You also understand why no salesman can convince his prospective purchaser unless he has first convinced himself of the merits of his goods. Throughout this entire course, one particular principle has been emphasized for the purpose of illustrating the truth that every personality is the sum total of the individual thoughts and acts. That we come to resemble the nature of our dominating thoughts. Thought is the only power that can systematically organize, accumulate, and assemble facts and materials according to a definite plan. A flowing river can assemble dirt and build land, and a storm can gather and assemble sticks into a shapeless mass of debris. But neither storms nor rivers can think. Therefore, the materials which they assemble are not assembled or organized definite form. Man alone has the power to transform his thoughts into physical reality. Man alone can dream and make his dreams come true. Man has the power to create ideals and rise to their attainment. How did it happen that man is the only creature on earth that knows how to use the power of thought? It happened because man is the apex of the pyramid of evolution and product and the product of millions of years of struggle during which man has risen above the other creatures of the earth as a result of his own thoughts and their effects upon himself. Just when, where, and how the first rays of thought began to flow into man's brain, no one knows. But we all know that thought is the power which, was, which distinguishes man from all other creatures. Likewise, we all know that thought is the power that has enabled man to lift himself above all creatures. No one knows the limitations of the power of thought or whether or not it has any limitations. Whatever man believes he can do, he eventually does. But a few generations back, the more imaginative writers dared to write of the horseless carriage. And lo, it became a reality and now a common vehicle. Through the evolutionary power of thought, the hopes and ambitions of one generation become a reality in the next. 
The power of thought has been given the dominating position throughout this course for the reason that it belongs in that position. Man's dominating position in the world is the direct power and result of thought. And it must be this power that you as an individual will use in the attainment of success, no matter what may be your idea of what represents success. You have now arrived at the point at which you should take inventory of yourself for the purpose of ascertaining what qualities you need to give you a well-balanced and rounded out personality. 15 major factors enter, entered into the building of this course and analyze yourself carefully with the assistance of one or more other persons if you feel you need it for the purpose of ascertaining in which of the 15 factors of this course you are the weakest and then concentrate your efforts upon those particular lessons until you've fully developed those factors which they represent. The 15th and final law of success is the golden rule. And with that, we conclude this entire series. I highly recommend that you read through it yourself if you're so inclined. Again, it's available for free online as a PDF since it has outlined, since it's outlived its copyright. It was published almost 100 years ago and the philosophy, if not the science, is as sound as it was on the day it was published. And with that, we conclude our series on the law of success. I hope it has brought value to you and at least shown you that there is a pathway to success. I think the greatest challenge of the entire system is how to choose your definite chief aim. And that's something that I hope to talk more about in the future. But until then, I hope you look to employ these laws and go out into the world and find that path, that success that is yours alone. Thanks for watching. Until next time.